Please note that English is not my first language. I got my first serious job when I was 24 years old. I moved to Ukraine when I was 18, so I just understood the natural path to follow was to finish university and start working in the country. I had just recently ended a three-year relationship in which I was about to marry the best person in the world. Unfortunately, he had to return to his country and we broke up. I started dating a Ukrainian. I must say that they are good people and that's why I didn't see what I will tell you next. Transgenderism was recently decriminalized in Ukraine, which is why more jobs were open for these people. I must clarify that I have nothing against these people, neither before nor now. My own brother is transgender. He's a man. Anyways, when we were told someone new would join the team and they were transgender, I was more curious than anything else. Because of the pandemic, we had to start working from home. We had daily meetings and I was beginning to like this person. The only problem was, I was still in a relationship with a Ukrainian man, but time took over and separated us. Arena, not her real name of course, asked me if we could go out for a drink and we met at her apartment had a drink, and talked about her life. She had a strange obsession with her ex. From the beginning, I had a strange feeling that I didn't fully trust her, but I decided to ignore it. As time went by, we started dating more, but when I talked about my principles in a relationship, she just teased me in a way of seeing it as extremely stupid and old-fashioned. One day, we decided to talk about being together, and even though I refused, she repeated, I don't want to be alone. Everyone leaves me. Being an empathetic person, I knew what it was like to be alone. I'm an orphan. We decided to start a relationship, and it was not good at all. It brought out the worst in me. Things that I had never done, such as checking her messages, mainly because she never stopped being in contact with her ex, with whom she was obsessed with, and she began to distort my reality, making me see how crazy I was, saying everything that I would do was gaslighting. She used to call her friends and tell them how bad I was and I was destroying her life. My first thought in the morning was, I wish I was dead so she could just forget about me. I was diagnosed with anxiety and arrhythmia. I thought this was a guideline to leave her, so when she asked me to end the relationship, it was like a relief for me, but my problems just started at that moment. She started looking for me absolutely everywhere. When she couldn't communicate with me or know where I was, she wrote to my friends asking about me. She was checking at what time I arrived and would leave from work, and this led to several anxiety attacks. I decided to take vacations and go to Turkey for a week. She went crazy and also threatened my friend, who was working with us at the moment, saying if she doesn't know where I am, she will find out. Eventually, she got fired and I was feeling way more better. Bad thing is, she used to live near me and started to visit me without notifying me. I wouldn't even notice when she would come by. The person in charge of the building is a lovely old lady. One day, she approached me to tell me that my weird friend was coming over too often and she was tired of telling her that me and my roommate weren't home and she wasn't allowed to let her in. I thought she was confused. I have a lot of weird friends that come over until I saw her one day walking around my building and talking on the phone. I had to go to the hospital after that. I had another huge anxiety attack and I understood it was enough. My best friend, who was also my roommate, reported the incident to the police, but we never heard about it again until we were informed that someone had reported illegal activities and asked for my deportation. Fortunately, lawyers are solving the problem and I'm trying to recover from the whole situation with therapy for PTSD. I know it's not as strong as the other stories. Maybe that woman is reading this right now. All I want is that the people who have been through something like this to know that they're not alone and I hope I never meet this weirdo again and I hope their fake story doesn't get me in any trouble. A couple of years ago, before the pandemic started, a friend of mine, Mary, introduced me to a guy. He wasn't really my type, but she's one of those people who turns into a matchmaker when she's in a relationship, so I agreed to go on a couple of dates with him, so we wouldn't feel as worried that I would die alone and so on or whatever. The first time I met up with a guy, it was a group date with Mary, her boyfriend Tim, and another friend with her boyfriend. This guy Mary tried sending me up with Joe seemed alright. We talked, traded jokes, that sort of thing. 
It was comfortable with him because I wasn't interested in him. At the end of the night, he asked if we could meet up again sometime, and I agreed. Afterwards, I told Mary I was delighted. Her boyfriend Tim was not very happy though. Tim's training to become a doctor. He's a very smart guy, and my friends and I greatly value his opinion. There's something off about Joe, Tim said. I agreed, and Tim and I talked over it for a little bit, but neither of us had felt anything worse than just a little bit of weirdness. Be careful with Joe, Tim said, when I hugged my friends goodnight at the train station. Joe and I texted for a couple weeks before we met up again, and those exchanges only cemented my first impressions. I just wasn't into him, and something about him was off. He began to reveal a side of himself that was less friendly as well. He had very low self-esteem, and was always looking for reassurance. At first, that wasn't so bad, but it quickly turned toxic pretty quickly. He seemed to get off on that sort of attention. I didn't really want to go out with him again, but Mary was really invested in the idea of Joe and I getting together. Mary's a sweetheart, but she doesn't really have instincts. Occasionally that gets me, or someone else in the friend group into trouble. Mary's cute, and everybody wants to make her happy. She has good intentions, but because she has no instincts, she can't sense danger, and sometimes drags people into dangerous situations unwittingly. I was hoping this was not going to be one of those episodes. Anyway, Mary was excited about the next date, and Joe kept asking when I was going to meet him again, so I invited Joe to an event my hobby club was holding. I figured that was safe, because we'd be surrounded by people I knew well. The evening was alright, Joe wasn't as creepy in person as he was over text, at least as creepy as he's been lately. After the event, we walked along the river for a bit, on a walkway crowded with families and tourists. We parted ways in the busy train station. I figured I'd just gently push this thing further into the realm of platonic, and everything would be alright. Then, on one night a couple weeks later, Joe called me and told me he was going to commit suicide. I freaked out and tried to calm him down. I stayed up all night talking to him, from when he called around 10pm until the sun rose. Every time he calmed down, I tried to say goodbye, but then he kept saying that if I hung up he would kill himself, so I stayed on the line, talking him down over and over again. Something about the situation felt wrong, but what else was I going to do? I wouldn't leave anyone to commit suicide. As I sat on my patio, watching the sun rise over the forest behind my house, he finally let me off the hook. He said thank you, and for a moment, I felt that I'd done the right thing. Maybe I had just saved a life. But then Joe said, with a voice full of glee, that was the best night of my life, and hung up. What the hell? Had this psycho really kept me up all night knowing full well that the next day was going to be busy for me, just to get off on the tension? I decided that there was no way in hell I was ever going to see this guy again. I told Mary what had happened, and she was apologetic. She agreed that Joe was a complete psycho, said she was sorry she set me up with him, and told me to call the cops if he ever came to my home. I didn't think he would. Joe didn't have my address, but neither did the person Mary had met him through. I didn't give out my address to anyone but trustworthy family members, because I don't want my abusive ex-step-parent to find me. That precaution probably saved me from a much worse experience. As it was, when I broke it off with Joe, he took it pretty badly. He threatened to kill himself again, so I just messaged Mary, and she contacted her and Joe's mutual friend, who kept an eye on Joe for the next few days. Not long after that, I started getting creepy phone calls after midnight. They were often at 2 or 3 in the morning. The caller never said anything, just breathed heavily down the line. It was so unnerving. I blocked the number every time. Joe must have been going through 4 or 5 numbers before he switched his phone to private number to get around the caller ID. I couldn't block him anymore. I didn't know what to do. For more than a year and a half after Joe got a private number, I was forced to answer every single one of his calls. A whole branch of my family had private numbers because one of them was scammed a while back. Luckily the police caught the scammer and they didn't end up losing any money, but unfortunately for me, that meant I received a call from a private number at night. I had to pick it up in case anything happened to a member of my family. One particular night. My phone went off at 3 in the morning. It was a private number. I knew it was just probably Joe. I was staring at my phone trying to work out what to do. I never let the calls go to voicemail because, apart from the whole family issue, even if he didn't know where I lived, 
Certainly he knew where Mary and Tim's house was. I was afraid that if I didn't play along, he might go after my friends. The phone was still ringing, and I reached out to swipe up and answer the call, then paused. I had an idea. Back when I was in high school, my dad would sometimes call early in the morning if no one else was in the house. I'd be woken up, stumble over to the phone half awake, and answer it with a slightly crocky voice. I have a low voice for a woman, so every time I answered the phone like that, my dad would mistake me for my brother, John. I realized I could use that to my advantage. I cleared my throat, dropped my voice as low as I could, and said, Hello? I was delighted with the result. I sounded exactly like John. It was uncanny. It made me a little sad, really, because John died a year before I met Joe. It was a bit of a jolt, hearing something so close to his voice again, after almost three years. I quickly grabbed my phone before it could ring out, tapping the answer button, then said that deep, Hello? Again? This time, there was no creepy heavy breathing, only silence. I said another deep, hello? After a moment's pause, Joe hung up on me. I was overjoyed. Every other time, I'd had to hang up on him. No matter what I said before, he had always wanted as much of my time as he could get. I let myself feel a flicker of hope. Maybe I was free. It's been over a year now, and it looks like I'm free of Joe. I haven't gotten any creepy calls since I pulled out my John impersonation, and I can only guess that Joe thinks I changed my number, or given it to someone else. Joe never met John, so when I said hello, he probably just heard a young man's voice. If John were still here, I know he'd approve. If I could tell him now, he'd be very happy to know that a part of him could still protect me, even after many years after he was gone. I would probably spend my life looking over my shoulder. Every time someone attacks the bins on my street, I worry it might be Joe. Every time a beat up car passes me as I walk to the bus stop or the train station, I worry it might be him. I've heard from mutual friends that Joe has said some awful things about me. He told some people he slept with me, which he didn't of course. Who'd sleep with someone that creepy? Worse than that, Joe and Mary's mutual friends have said that Joe told her he wants to kill me. Mary and I were both horrified by that. The friend has since told him that I've moved to another city, so that might be enough. She's very close to him, distantly related actually, so he believes what she tells him. When I'm done with my studies, I'm going to move across the country. Until then, I'm keeping my head down. My campus and Joe's campus are a 30 minute train ride apart. That's nowhere near far enough away, but it will have to do for now. There is one positive thing that came out of this. Mary's now completely cured of any desire to play matchmaker. Oh, and Joe, let's just never meet again. Several years ago, I was in the midst of an acrimonious divorce from my then-husband, full of crazy allegations and typical angry feelings centered around the custody of our child. As with many divorces, Friends and professional colleagues seem to pick one side or the other. In my case, there's one sort of professional contact who reached out to me after hearing about the divorce who offered to be a witness for my case because of some experiences he related that I had been previously unaware of regarding my ex's behavior out of the networking events. After this initial call, he started calling me on a semi-regular basis to make sure I was okay. This wasn't someone I knew well prior to the separation and he was much older than I was, but claimed to have experience with divorce and custody and I figured it would be a good idea to be polite and not offend him, since his testimony was important, per my lawyer. I kept things friendly, but I always had a weird feeling about him. After a few months, he called me one day that my son was very sick and when I told him I couldn't talk and explained why, he offered to run to the store for me, which I honestly appreciated, but after that, he was dropping by the house uninvited, or he would stop by with cookies for my son, etc. Again, I kept telling myself to keep things polite. The divorce is coming soon, don't make this guy mad. He called me out of the blue, and I was worried at this point that I was walking on a very fine line of being polite but clearly not interested, and that if he got mad, he might decide to testify for my ex and say who knows what. During this time, he also helped me set up a security camera system my dad had mailed me, and at one point, I needed someone to walk my dog, and he offered to do it. He used and returned a spare key the same day. One evening, 
He showed up while I was painting and insisted on sticking around to help, even though I was having my starting over catharsis and wanted to do it alone. Just after the planning day, he came around, uninvited and unannounced like always, with magazine photos of decor and started carrying on with this manic way of how we could finish decorating the house. I was so weirded out that I made an excuse to leave. That's when I started to ignore his calls and took my son and dog to stay at my parents for several weeks to avoid a drop in. I only came home for custody exchanges. I came home a few weeks later thinking he would have gotten the hint and it was a quiet day. The following morning, I took my son to an outing, something like a zoo, and we both came back hot and tired. I put my kiddo down for a nap in the bed and decided to close my eyes with him. I woke up maybe an hour or so later and it took me a moment to realize something was way off. As I'm blinking off the sleep, I realized that a rose bush was sitting on my bedside table and I most definitely had not put that there. There was a post-it note on it, something about playing in the yard. I started shaking immediately because I recognized the handwriting and stood up to go splash some water in my face and decide whether to call my parents or the police. I didn't want any trouble because of this divorce. As I stepped into my bathroom, I realized that the mirror was covered in post-it notes, all with super creepy messages that were intended like love notes or with infection, but it all just scared me. I was still waking up and trying to figure out how these notes could have possibly gotten into my house. My front door was definitely locked, but I went to every room and there was just notes everywhere. I mean, hundreds of post-it notes covering the walls, in my cabinets, there was even one inside my coffee maker. They were all over just random parts of the house. I started to grab all them and put them into a pile. When I got to one end in the kitchen, I saw one that made my blood run cold. It said, you're cute when you think no one is watching you. That's when I realized that there's a security camera pointed right to the wall where the note was left. The same cameras he had helped me set up months earlier when I didn't think he was a psychopath. I called my parents in hysterics, sent them a bunch of photos, and my dad insisted I should not call the police. Remember, custody battle. But instead, that he would drive over and change the locks and put a chain on the door. We also immediately changed the passwords on the security cameras, which had been installed to document if my ex tried to break into the house. So there was one on the front porch, but three inside the house, including one in my bedroom. This man could apparently see and hear everything going on inside my house for months. As for the security cameras, I realized he had just paid attention to my passwords when I was setting one up in the system. But the only way I can figure out how he got into my house is that if he had a copy to my door key. I was thinking that the day that I gave him a copy to go walk the dog, he might have went and got another copy on his own and that's what he'd been using to get into the house. And because my dog had gotten to know him, he wouldn't have barked to warn me, which also scared me to think about. I was absolutely horrified. This man had been in my house for a long time. There's no way he could have put up that many notes so quickly. And he was right next to my face and feet away from my son while we were sleeping and somehow thought that was okay. I left and stayed with my parents again for a few days, afraid of what he was going to do when he realized that he was now both physically and digitally locked out of my life and my house. When I came home, my son had gone to his dad's for the night, and I was home alone, on the phone with another friend from out of town. At about 10pm, this man showed up at the door, pounding on it, trying the locks, screaming obscenities and demanding to be let into his house. Gone were all the niceties. This was someone completely furious and derailed. All I could do was hide in my bedroom until he left, which felt like an hour later. This was St. Patrick's Day, so... I'm sure he had been drinking. After that, there were several other times someone would start knocking on the door in the middle of the night, always when my son wasn't home. I think he was crazy, but not that crazy, and I figured if I called the police he would get in more trouble if my son was there, but he knew the schedule, so I knew it was him. He tried reaching out using fake social media accounts several times, always just getting blocked. Years later, I discovered that he'd friended my mom on Facebook, and was therefore still able to see all the photos of us that she posted or shared, and there was a huge argument when I saw she had left her computer logged in, a conversation they were having about me, and about how he could get back into my life. 
I eventually sold that house two years later, still finding new notes even as I was packing, and I'm more than relieved that he no longer knows where I live. I don't post photos of my new house online, not the front anyway, and I changed the privacy settings on all my social media accounts. I avoid all the places he used to go, the networking events he attends, and I stay as under the radar as possible. I could never bring myself to play back the security camera videos because I was traumatized enough and didn't want to see how much danger we could have been in. Hopefully he never sees this post, but you know who you are. I hope our paths don't cross again.